The Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Free your mind and the rest will follow. A show for all who are on the journey to discover the truths about their identity, history, culture, politics, spirituality, and family relationships. This is a show for the Black Freedom Movement and the Black Power Generation and the Hip Hop Generation, including Black Lives Matter and associate activists, all of whom are seeking change. Dr. Oba Tashaka and his guests are dropping knowledge and insight from his successful organizing, research, writings, and innovative thoughts, the best of which have piped into God's mind to lift you up higher and higher. To the bosses, OGs, rappers, influencers, and those looking to evolve from the constraints of misinformation and miseducation to build a foundation for personal growth, love, and mental freedom. Check out the wisdom of the OR. Yeah, that's the original revolutionary, Oba T, who inspired a million black men with his rousing speech at the Million Man March and who continues to fight, write, and speak the truth. Dr. Oba Tashaka is one of the deepest deep thinkers in the world today. A quote by Dr. Asa Hilliard. Dr. Oba Tashaka, then Bill Bradley, was the best leader organizer in the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE. An endorsement from Dr. George Wiley, Associate Director of National CORE and the best organizer blacks produced in the 1970s as the organizer of the National Welfare Rights Organization. The Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Free your mind and the rest will follow. Greetings uh, to uh, the viewers of the Dr. Oba Tashaka Show. Uh, that's me. <laughs> For those of you that don't know, uh, Oba Tashaka. Um, I've enjoyed the uh, various shows that we've had. Sister Robin, good morning. Uh, Stephen McKenzie, Brother Ogawa, Jimmy Taylor, uh, welcome. Um, I've been enjoying these shows and um, we've been doing things to uh, try and improve them as well. Brother Kamari, um, thanks for some of the references that you sent. I wrote down a few more books and actually picked one on Amilcar Cabral that you sent me that uh, I think might actually uh, help in the research I'm doing on the book that I'm finishing. Um, before getting into the topic today, I just wanted to uh, note some other steps we're taking to improve the show. Um, I hired a, um, a firm that handles uh, recruiting subscribers, and they ran about a four-day campaign, and um, that campaign generated about uh, 1,600 new viewers. Um, but what was interesting is um, when I looked at the demographics of the views, that demographic went from uh, 13 years of age uh, through the 60s with the greatest concentration between 13 and the late 40s. And uh, so that's, that's interesting at a nice view time, a number of people watching for a fair amount of time. But what was really interesting is the demographic spread. Um, you know, when you do these things to uh, recruit uh, more viewers and subscribers, um, it's a demographic profile they go off of. And um, so in, in this particular case, um, the age spread was, was very good. But what was really interesting was the geographical spread. Um, 
when you do these kind of shows, you'll pick a show that you want to highlight. So I picked one, which is the God Within series that had generated a good response. And um, then when I looked at the uh, uh, geographical spread um, yesterday, uh, what I was really impressed with was that while this show, which came on March of last year, uh, which is dealing with humanism and the spirit of God that dwells within, had generated a nice geographical spread. But what I've noted is with this little drive that we did, it's picked up a lot in terms of the geography. So more of Africa has been picked up. Interestingly enough, viewers from the Ukraine and Russia <laughs> um, and um, Jamaica, which we've had before, and the Jamaica view time was fairly long, and that's that's what's really important. And then Europe uh, with the UK, again, having one of the longest view times, and Kenya, a long view time, um, and um, some other areas as well uh, in Asia. So that's interesting, and um, that's something that we want to do because the visions that we're putting forward here are for, first of all, my people. It's a poor frog that doesn't praise its own pond, and uh, people of color, and anyone that's conscious, and especially uh, the globe, Africa, or wherever people are in the world, but especially Africa and the Caribbean, but the world. And so um, that's the start of that, and we'll see how this goes. But uh, that's a beginning. And by the way, that costs money. And so a few people have made donations. I would appreciate it uh, if you could continue that and others could as well, uh, because um, it, it, that's also going to be required. So um, that's a little, um, little insight on another improvement we've made on the show. Um, for the last well, four shows, three of those shows have focused on the Black Panther Party. And uh, we we're privileged to have uh, Brother Emery Douglas, former Minister of Culture for the Black Panther Party. And I've told some people who are in the party uh, that this would be on. And their overall comments was, Brother Emery's a beautiful brother. You know, and these are from former party members, one of whom um, is a faculty teaching at San Francisco State. I already knew that, and that's one reason why I brought him on, that he was active in the party from its formation, but he has a great character. You can see he's a humble person and um, a magnificent artist and a revolutionary artist. So, um, you know, we had the pleasure of going through some stuff on the formation and the expansion of the party, some hits from the FBI and so forth. And then we focused last week's show on Brother Emery Douglas's art is just magnificent. Now, of course, he focused on what he calls his revolutionary art, which is a lot of the art comes out of the Black Panther Party. So you didn't get to see um, his other art, which is portrait art, which is magnificent. Uh, you saw very little of it, but you saw it in the uh, way in which <clears throat> his art was portrayed for the Black Panther Party. You saw it in the beauty of the people, and it shows the love that he has for Black people and African people and humanity at large. And then what I found really interesting was the way in which um, people around the world I have embraced his art, and particularly revolutionaries, the Mayan people, for example, the Zapatistas, um, who rose up in Chiapas. And you saw how they did some collaboration in their art. But you could see the love that they had for his work and the way in which they transposed it into Mayan art, uh, drawing on his themes, and the way he's drawn on some global themes in his own art. Uh, so that's just one example of the power of African-American culture 
And in this particular case, its highest expression is art form. By art, we mean music, painting, poetry, all the, all the high art performances. It doesn't mean that because someone's in this, they're at the highest rung. It depends on the quality of what they're contributing. It depends on their message. It depends on a whole lot. And uh, he represents the best coming out of his own world, which is the world of drawing and painting um, coming out of a revolutionary mindset. So that was uh, really a pleasure uh, to, um, you know, talk to him and then uh, get his insights on the party and then see the beauty of his contribution to the world. And one of my favorite pictures in there was the embrace that he received from a brother from New Zealand, a Maori who had the, um, the artwork on his face and the way in which they embraced was like warrior to warrior. That was a really beautiful picture right there. That said a whole lot. And then he said when he was there, a bird flew off a porch or something. And these are spiritual people. They said, that's a sign you'll be back. And he's been back many times. So um, that's a testimony to Brother Emery and his creativity to the party, but to our people and to this beautiful culture that we need to spend more time um, studying and um, refining. Um, it's a poor frog that don't praise its own pond. It's a poor mother that can't find something to praise about her own children. And most black mothers are going to find a whole lot even for some that don't deserve much. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so um, I've always said our greatest weakness as a people is we underestimate our own strengths and we let the woe is me stuff tear us down too much. You know what I mean? So um, this was uh, really uh, beautiful. Um, today, um, the topic for today's show is twin lineal,ism the alternative to Arianism. Now, for some people, they're not going to know what that means. If you've been following the show, uh, you will. Or if you read the book, Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality, that's featured um, in the promotional for this show. Uh, it's, it's the most important thing I've done in my life is this work. So this theme is drawing from this work. Um, but you'll notice that the shows that have preceded this um, have had an overall method. And that is when I'm drawing on the past to apply the past to the present. So how do we use the past to transform uh, what we're facing in the present and will face in the future? So I call that make the past serve the present. And so there's always that dimension. Um, and um, the overall purpose is to be able to draw from models that come out of our systems, our just societies, uh, to um, transform the society in which we're living and the world from unjust to just. So that's the real purpose. And so my works have ended up being uh, systems. It has not been my intention. I didn't start with that intention, but that's been the end result that I end up uh, coming up with breakthroughs in different areas and they end up being systems. And because I'm an organizer and warrior, these systems have been applied. So they're not put out until they work. And the two best of the systems that I've drawn from uh, have come from God, the beautiful light. And when those have um, come up, um, those have been the most important breakthroughs for me because God's been kind enough to reveal truths of the cosmos not previously known. Um, and so the twin lineal family uh, and twin lineal just society system 
that this show will be focusing on today with the topic of trilinealism, the alternative to Arianism, of all of the breakthroughs that I've been able to come up with, this has been the most important because this came from a big question and God gave me a big answer. The big question, what's the basis for just societies of ancient Africa? And um, when God gave me the formula for just societies of male, female empowerment and led me to the twa, then uh, God was leading me on a spiral and that spiral would take me different places because God's mind <clears throat> is a whole mind. And so, as I pointed out before, in Dogon philosophy, uh, I formulated this principle coming out of their philosophy. If you take a part of their system, that part is always a reflection of the whole. And in part, that's because we're all microcosms of this larger whole. In this case, as human beings, microcosms of the cosmos. And so from Dogon philosophy, I've drawn this principle in anything is everything. And so concentrated in one symbol in Dogon thought and African thought is symbolic, is the whole system in that one part. I pointed this out before. If you know yourself, you'll know that one part of you reveals the whole. And if you're observant of people, you know the same thing. I'm an organizer. I watch people. And there are certain expressions and stuff. When they come up, you told me everything about yourself. You know what I mean? And if it isn't good, I'm taking measures. You know what I mean? Measures. And so with this vision of the just society that God gave me, that I termed trilineal, um, it was giving a whole, a whole picture that was practiced for over 130,000 years or longer <clears throat> that was the secret basis for these societies being just. I say secret because before uncovering this, this was not known. It was like Einstein's theory of relativity, you know, the fact that time is relative is the truth of the cosmos, not discovered until he had a dream, saw himself riding a sled going at the speed of light, and then looking at the stars and then having another intuitive breakthrough. That's the theory of relativity. So when God gives you answers, they're holes of a part, and there are no holes, H-O-L-E-S, in them. The only holes are the holes that I could make or someone else makes in their interpretation. And I always have to give God credit for this because that's where it came from. And um, a lot of people are suspicious because you've been trained either to believe there's no such thing as the truth. That's the white boy stuff. I know you that watch this show and others don't believe that. Um, and that there ain't no such thing as no light. Some even question if there's God, that we even now have a growing group of black atheists, which I understand. I'm not putting them down. Because while in ancient Africa, there was not a single atheist, given the hell we've gone through, if you think God was behind it, I could see why you might call yourself an atheist. But actually, God wasn't behind any of it. God didn't stuff us on the good ship, Jesus. That was John Hawkins. In case you don't know, he wasn't God. He was working for the queen on greedy business. So um, this show is, is going to be drawing on this beautiful model that worked for the longest period of human history. And so I'm suggesting that if you think that something that worked for 130,000 years and longer, couldn't be updated to the day, you better think again. You hear me? And got us running around here copying somebody else who's messed the planet up, who's only been here a minute. And the further we go into their mess, the less time we're going to have, certainly in eternity, 
may not have any time in the right place, if you know what I mean. <laughs> so um, this show has focused on um, historical themes of uh, the Anu, the people who founded ancient Kemet, who happened to be Chua. Um, the Chua themselves, we went through a five-part series on this. Uh, we've looked at ancient African culture and African-American culture and shown how these um, just society themes have played in uh, Kemet or Egypt, uh, pre-dynastic, ancient, and as well as dynastic, and how it generally played in African societies, how the Chua civilized the world and so forth. So one of the points about this is that the omission of the Chua from history is kind of like um, building a house uh, with, really, it, it would be like building a house without a foundation, because even though there is a foundation, you don't know what it is, or with a weak foundation, because you can't build one without a foundation. Uh, and so lacking an understanding of what this foundation is, then the house of civilization is weak. That includes African civilization, let alone world civilization. It's kind of like knowing the person, but not knowing the parent, you know? I mean, you know, uh, there's a lot of the uh, parent in the person, you know? If you're dating, always check out if you're a brother, check out the lady's mother. If you're um, a sister, check out the brother's mother and then check out their fathers. <clears throat> and in an age in which a lot of them don't know their fathers, well, who's the significant male others? Check them out. Because very often the leaf doesn't fall too far from the tree. You know what I mean? And so we have a lot of unexplained behavior going on in history that we don't understand, particularly with African people. Where did it come from? We'll trace it to Kemet. Oh, Kemet's not the first civilization. It's important, but you got to go to the root to understand the fruit. So um, leaving the Chua out of history is like leaving the foundation out. And without that, you don't really understand your history. Um, so when God gives me this vision of the just society, it leads me to the Chua, um, I immediately get the vision of the just society, which I'm going to be applying in different ways today. But I come to realize that, oh, it's much more. He gave me the Chua. God gave me the Chua. Follow the Chua. And so I've been following them in every way I possibly can. And it leads me to the Anu in Kemet, you know? It leads me to the foundation of African civilization in general. It leads me to the foundation of world civilization. And so I realize that God gave me much more, but as like a good speaker, God speaking to you on your level, so you get what you asked for. So I asked for the vision of the just society. God gave me that, but God was giving me much more. And so in previous shows, uh, I've talked about, uh, on the Chua, I talked about how was it that they could innovate civilization, being the world's first people. You would expect the first people to be backward, not that well informed. They would have to stumble and, you know, fall and get themselves up before they can get anything going. But right off, they come up with the most profound understanding of God. Seeing as how they just came from heaven, that shouldn't have been too hard. The totality of forces of which a part is distributed to everything God creates. That's the best definition of God I've heard. Now, the bombard come close. Infinite force outside of space and outside of time. That's physics. Both of them, by the way, are physics. No wonder if their God concept is right, they had no trouble innovating physics astrophysics, medicine, um, technology of, of various kinds, even though they lived in a state of simplicity by choice. They were wise. You understood? You understand? Because 
They understood what was key to happiness, justice, truth, of which they were the embodiment of. By the way, there's a general rule in philosophy, you know, that um, whenever you have societies reach a point where they need laws, that's usually a sign that there's a breakdown in the following of certain things. So when you have a society, for example, that has the law of ma'at, that's a very high order. That's a good thing, you know? But the fact that they have to have laws on this, it's not in a book, but it's spoken, speak truth, do truth, and a whole lot of others, means some people are departing from it. The Twa operated on this without ever articulating laws. Why? Because they lived it. So Mazuri, M-A-A-S-O-U-R-I, is the root of Ma'at. And it precedes it. But it's affirmed through practice, the Twa daily practice, truth. Spoke it and walked it, you know? And so they didn't need the laws because they were living in the realm of oneness with God. And so therefore they could innovate civilization, but we don't study them. I think truth and justice, most important thing. The most beautiful thing is the truth and the people who embody it. That's why we had Emory on. I'm not putting him on a pedestal. He's a human being, but a good human being. And for me, that's the most important thing. And it should be for you. The truth is the most beautiful thing going, you know, and the Chua embody it. So the Chua were able to draw on the vibrational frequencies of God, which enabled them to make the greatest innovations in human civilization. Um, and that's because they um, had mir mirrors, mirrors, that is their characters were pure. And as a result, they could make these great contributions and therefore erect societies based on the just society principle, which is, this is the heart of twin lineal-ism, is based on all the males and females being equally empowered to govern every phase of society. That's Those are God's words. Those aren't mine. That came to me through the light. That is the secret basis for the justness of Chua societies and of the justness of subsequent African and global civilizations that were based on that. Because all societies, all people come out of Africa, they come out of the Chua, specifically the Kung. K-U-N-G or San people of Kalahari Desert and then other Chua who, um, you know, are, and you know, a part of their family. So this system of just societies prevailed in the hunter-gatherer stage for over 130,000 years. And by the way, the Chua chose not to step out of hunter-gatherer for a long time. They knew how to do agriculture. I mean, if you know astrophysics and quantum physics and you got this deep insight into God and you got these paranormal powers and all that, you don't think you could figure out agriculture? They also figured out what came along with it, work. <laughs> and the Trois were not lazy, but they lived in a leisure state. Most plentiful society humans live on the planet. No slavery, no oppression. Hmm. That was their heaven on earth. That came as close to what they experienced uh, in heaven. Uh, so this system would prevail uh, for, depending on the time uh, periods that we're dealing with, 144,000 years. Some would like to say 200,000 years, but mitochondrial DNA, 140. 150 or 130, given that 10,000 year error rate of mitochondrial DNA. Uh, but some would like to go back further. But the key point is that um, during a, at least 130,000 years, um, people lived in this state, and as Africans migrated out of Africa, they carried this vision and practiced other parts of the world. 
This is only disrupted, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. I, I know you all just love that. You ain't too interested in your own just society model. It's mainly the white boy. So anything you say about the white boy, oh, you go crazy, you know? Huh. I spent years fighting them. You know what I mean? Um, they're not hard to figure out. I, I'll just briefly delve into them. But um, it's their presence that disrupts this model. But this model has such a deep imprint on humanity that it is one that still exists inside the souls of black folks, wherever they are in the world, and the souls of people in general. Because after you've experienced freedom for 130,000 years, it's in your DNA, it's in your cellular memory, it's all over the place. But it's basically in common sense. You don't need to go digging too deep to really appreciate what this represents. <clears throat> so the practice of just societies and the vision where all the males and females equally empowered to govern every phase of society prevail globally throughout human history until the introduction of the Aryan between 4500 and 2500 BC. And um, I'll get back into that later. But that's the model that all Indo-Europeans, as they like to call them, but they're really Indo-Aryans, Indo referring to their movement out of what was Russia uh, in uh, certain parts of Russia, Ukraine, and places like that, um, into India, and then sweeping into the rest of Europe, and then other parts of the world. And so Indo is referring to their presence in India, where they end up conquering India. Um, and um, that's where they establish a racial caste system and so forth and so on. So, so this is the force that comes in that's behind what we call Europeanism today. And uh, most European scholars don't want to deal with this one because it's rough and uh, rugged and savage. And they don't want to be associated with it. They want to put, put this all in the uh, bin of Hitler. Well, no, uh -uh. Hitler was just resurrecting something that is a part of what's called the European past. So that's the disruption. I'll get into it, but that's not the main theme of this show. It's, it's really going to be how do you take these old models and this one, the trilineal one that still prevails in your culture, you just don't know it, and resurrect it and raise it up so that it becomes a model for how you live your best life. And for some of you, it is already. Because if you're in a good relationship, chances are you're drawn from these models. You know, If you're in harmony with yourself, chances are you're drawn from this model. You know, And I'll deal with it a little bit. But I'm going to say, you really want to understand this. Read Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality. Don't use me as a substitute for reading. You hear me? Because I'm hitting the top of stuff. You got to go into the depths, you know? So um, while there's this intrusion, it's important to understand that um, the equal empowerment model practiced by the Twa and then, you know, by, by the world, which I define um, as a twin lineal system. Um, was a system of both equal rights and equal power. And they weren't into the constitutional stuff that I'm going to get into today, of constitutional rights, because their constitution came from within, you know. Uh, but the twin lineal way of male-female empowerment was the way males and females had equal powers. This formula is foolproof and it's simple because as long as males don't have any more power than females, they can't oppress them and females don't have any more power than males, they can't oppress them. Now, that isn't the sole reason why this just society system worked. People had a high ethical commitment. They had a high level of spirit development that you call spiritual, being in tune with God. Uh, but 
um, it was this balance uh, between males and females and the synthesis of masculine and feminine drawing the male from the feminine's qualities with the masculine prevailing so that there's a sense of purpose as a man and the female from the masculine with the feminine predominating so that there's a sense of purpose as a female, you know? Uh, but it was the synthesis that uh, some of us have to work to gain back because of the intrusion of alien views coming from <clears throat> this Aryan model that the Twa didn't have to deal with and much of Africa didn't have to deal with. So um, this is really the simplicity of the whole thing. And by the way, um, as a revolutionary who's been engaged in struggle now about 63 years, having a long range view of things has been really key uh, for my life having purpose while engaged in short term struggles for change and engaged in a day to day life, you know, where, you know, you're trying to make some kind of contribution to humanity. But having a sense of where things are going has helped sustain me, and I think it will help sustain you. But it also takes some vision because you have to be able to be invested in seeing ahead while you're dealing with things right now. And the sixfold stages to mental freedom is that path where uh, whatever blockages we have in identity, wherever shortcomings we have, we can even them out, work them out, and where we go inside ourselves and have the deepest sense of self-knowledge, self-respect, and self-love that then enables us to deal in the moment and enjoy the moment, whatever it is, and at the same time, have a foot in the future. Basically, if you're a parent, that's what you've done. You know, you've had a big foot in the future. You invested 18 years or more of your life into helping uh, develop a child into adulthood, you know, and that's investing in the future. And so that's the most important investment any of us would make in the future. But then there's the investment in the future of your people and the investment in the future of humanity. But if you're caught up in this woe is me thing, mighty whitey, and uh, I can't do anything, then uh, you will find yourself tied up in frustration. And of course, you're in the realm of fear, stress, and other things, which under an oppressive system, it's certainly going to try and cause, uh, then it's going to take you off of putting as much time as you can into how you're going to transform your future. Future can be uh, two or three years from now. Future can be how are we going to improve our families and our communities and ourselves. But future can be two or 300 years or four or 500. That's the realm I deal with while I'm dealing with right now. And uh, that then leads you to focus on the eternal things. And that's why I think I was so fortunate to receive this vision from God. I was asking a big question. What's the basis for just societies? I wasn't asking, how can I make a million dollars or something? I was asking something about how can uh, we draw from the past to make this present um, not only livable, but enjoyable free as opposed to oppressed. And so that's that's where the real joy in life comes in, you know. Um, dealing in the moment, but at the same time, preparing for the future. But you have to believe that you have a future. You have to believe that your past has relevance for today and tomorrow. You have to believe that. And uh, that, that's a fact. It is. You know, we are all of everything that we've ever been and what we believe. And if we can see it, believe it, we can make it happen. So um, this twin lineal model that was transplanted 
by the trials they moved around the planet um, is a model for not only African people, but people globally. And it resides in the heart of people throughout the world because people basically want a good life. People don't want to live in misery. And people are entitled to be free of that. And so that is really what this vision of the just society is based on. Um, so I've noted in previous discussions that the twin lineal model um, that the African carried to the United States and Western Hemisphere that the African has on the African continent that the African has globally uh, rejects the idea of having anyone over us. The average African in the world does not like authority imposed on them. They don't like it. And their cultures have generally reflected that. Even in the most stratified societies of kings and queens, the societies were run at the village level by males and females having an equal say-so. And the kings of Ghana stayed out of village business. African independence leaders would have done much better if they had allowed Africa, which was self-sufficient in food at the point of independence, to chart its course economically with the government coming in with some ideas that they brought to the people, as Chancellor Williams was advised they should do when he wrote his book, Rebirth of African Civilization. In the 50s, when Ghana was then struggling for independence, the people said, uh, we want our leaders to come to us, share their ideas with us. And when they listen to us, draw from our ideas, then take it forward and move on. And they said they wanted cooperative democracy. That is, they didn't want um, Marxism. Um, they didn't even call it socialism. What they were referring to when they said cooperative democracy was the communal way where the air, land, and water was shared. And what they wanted to do was to continue that, but they wanted improvements. They wanted this to be updated for the 20 and now 21st century. And had African leaders understood that the people who are the repositories of the culture are the first source, source that you draw from, Africa would be in much better shape. They'd still be dealing with the IMF, the World Bank, the International Monetary Fund, the CIA, FBI, and all the other forces. Well, what would they have to draw from that? The vision that comes out of Africa that had been disrupted mostly in the minds of the miseducated Africans that went to missionary schools and went to universities. And those who had recovered their minds like a Nureri or an Amilcar Cabral, or in this country, a Malcolm X and others could then um, overcome the colonial headaches and miseducation and the enslavement of the mind to free their behinds. You know what I mean? And so um, this old twin lineal model that's inside of African people and inside of humanity leads us to reject the idea of having anybody over us and dictating to us. And it doesn't mean that um, we just go off and just do our own thing. It means that collectives shape how we move. And the best ideas go forward. And that's called democracy. And that the African is has got that in his or her blood system. That's our nature. Uh, so this twin lineal tradition continues. This is why Zora Neale Hurston, who's one of the best observers uh, of African-American culture, she observed when she was talking about the spiritual blues, which is the foundation of our art form, um, that this was a music that came from the heart. And she said um, it had a message of freedom. 
And she said, it wasn't a bunch of sound effects. Or I would even say it wasn't an expression of choral unison, where everybody is singing the same way as we sometimes do with the music now. And there's some beauty in that. But true spirituals or the spiritual blues was an expression of each person's soulful experience. Each person was a choir within themselves. And it was an expression of raw emotion without, as Zora Neale Hurston said, sound effects. In other words, it was genuine and it came from the soul. It was a democratic expression of the African spirit. Jazz is a music without a government in charge. We don't like anybody over us dictating to us. Even when we have band leaders like Duke Ellington, probably the greatest composer in jazz, great musical leader, he would compose compositions for each instrument and the peculiar way in which each musician played. And so that was his uh, kind of thing. But he had a bunch of masters playing with him. And so these masters were free to go inside themselves and come up with new music. And this is, of course, the way jazz works, you know? Hip hop, while it was largely male initiated in the beginning, it couldn't keep the sisters out. And it was an expression, a democratic expression of the state of black youth at that time, where they're undergoing a choice between two cultures. Communities are getting hit. Places like the Bronx, where it comes into being, look like war zones, buildings on fire almost every day because landlords are burning up their buildings so that you know they can collect on the insurance. Why? Because now in this period where you're sending jobs overseas, a lot of these jobs have dried up. And so black people don't have the kind of money they had before. And so as a result, uh, a lot of these buildings are being allowed to just go down to nothing. But the expression of hip hop, which by the way, hip, a Wolof expression coming from hippie cat, meaning seeing from all sides. Being hip, one of the reasons why the culture is so popular. It's hip, it's cool, but it is an expression also of ma'at, seeing from all sides. So we see hip hop, a democratic expression coming from the souls of black folks. This is again, an expression of male female empowerment with hip hop, a heavy inclination towards males. Um, so the Twa practice of a just talk was followed by a just walk. And that entitled them to be, not just because they were the world's first people, the mothers and fathers of humanity and the authors of Masuri. Truth and justice, uprightness, based on their practice and therefore the source of Ma'at. Now, each male and female was their own government under the twin lineal system. And decisions were based on consensus of the males and females, starting in hunter, hunter, hunting and gathering bands and then later in agrarian societies. And this Equal male-female empowerment was an expression of a system where um, males and females were in charge of every area of their life. No one was over them, dictating to them, but it was the decisions of the group when it came to collective uh, issues. Um, and so each male and female was exercising their God-given powers to govern every phase of society, including the power to think and express their own thoughts 
and African traditional society, not just the Twa, have had a great respect for the uh, human being, recognizing that every human being carries a destiny, and therefore being very respectful of how you interact with another human being, because you're interacting with another universe, another cosmos. And so listening um, to what others have to say, very important. And uh, respecting it, whether you agreed with it or not. And so in the hunting band, the origination of this male and female empowerment uh, comes from the decisions in the hunting band where the hunters are getting together and collectively agreeing. And usually, as I pointed out before, the best hunters' views are probably going to carry more weight because they're more successful in capturing game. But it's the decision of the group. The same thing in the gathering societies of sisters. Yeah? That, again, it was that exchange. The same thing in the relationship of wife to husband and husband to wife and how the family was handled. And because this was a society of kindness, the men are playing roles almost as equal to uh, the female when it comes to child rearing, carrying the child, nurturing the child and that. The mother's doing more, but the fathers are playing um, some very sensitive, uh, beautiful roles, hugging and kissing and whatnot. Um, and, and giving these young people the freedom to express themselves. And their conception of God, they're the authors of monotheism, but it's not a dictatorial monotheism. It's not some God who's separate from the human being dictating to them. But it is that force that is within you that the Twa called the Ilani that lights up the heavens and lights up, you know, all life that enables you to be who you are. And so it's a God of freedom, not a dictator and not a male or female. It's a force. And this force is really at the very foundation of all that is good, all that is beautiful, all that is kind, all that is gentle. We find this same twinlineal tradition among Native Americans. In societies where they had chiefs, the chiefs couldn't tell them what to do. <laughs> Why? Because the African who mothered them, they all humanity comes out of Africa. And the first people, as we pointed out in the series on uh, uh, the, the Chua migrations into America, and we were particularly using uh, Brother David Imhotep's work on that, which is very good, showing that the first people in America were Africans. And this is not displacing or dispossessing Native Americans. This became their homeland. And while we may have been the first, this is the place of their numerical dominant residence until the coming of the area. Hmm. Once again. And so this principle of male-female empowerment was so central for Native Americans that um, all a so-called chief or king could do was try and persuade the members of his nation to go a certain way. He had to be eloquent. And if they were persuaded, fine. But if not, uh-uh. And it was common among Native Americans that in war, they would pick their war party heads again, you know? And war wasn't all that serious. And of course, for them, uh, key thing about having purpose in life was a vision quest, where they go out on a mountain or something after having been uh, prepared by their priest. And uh, in search of a vision, it's called a vision quest, where uh, for Days and nights, they would go without food and hope to have a vision from God that would give them an idea of their purpose in life. 
And African people did this as well, during enslavement and after as well, you know. Sometimes in the, uh, the schools that we had, uh, Freedmen's Bureau, some of the kids would come back, black children, uh, after a weekend, sleepy. Why? They had been in the graveyard, communing with spirits. And they had also been undergoing vision quests. They come out of African culture, not Native American culture. That was a part of their cultural experience to find their ori, their destiny, which they also pursued in enslavement. That's why the Obia men and women were the natural leaders because they were the diviners. And they were not just telling them how they could avoid being whipped. They were giving them clues about what would be successful in escape to freedom or how they could express their inner gifts and how long would they have to be under this mess called enslavement and what could they do to get out of it. The Iroquois Confederacy. Um, was based on this twin lineal model of clan mothers and clan fathers. Now the Iroquois Confederacy inclined towards females, but it was not as it's been characterized a matriarchal society because women did not rule in these societies. They had slightly more say so, but it was a system of male and female clan mothers and clan fathers who would pick the chief, first the clan mothers and then the clan fathers. When they had a consensus, then that person sat on the council. The Iroquois was made up of a number of Native American nations. And so when decisions were made, the clan, the, the clan mothers would send their views about what should happen. The clan fathers would. And if the clan, if the chiefs who wore antler heads disregarded these views, they were given notices a couple of times. And after that, the antler head, you know, was removed. The antlers that were the crown for the chiefs was removed. And in some cases, they were clubbed to death. It's called election and removal. <laughs> this is real serious business. But again, it was a twin lineal thing because you can't be free if only one part of a group that is, is free. You understand? The whole group has got to be free. Um, so Native Americans had this embedded in them. And it's because it's natural, you know what I mean? You are supposed to have a say-so in your life, both males and females, it's natural. And then of course, it was institutionalized, first in Africa and then around the world. So the first break in the in imbalance between males and females did not come from the Aryan. When I was doing the research on the mother principle I spent time in Ghana. I was looking at the Asante Hina, Asante Wa, King, Queen, Mother system. And uh, <clears throat> I did other research and stuff. And I have a priest, uh, and I referred to before, a Raba, second highest office in the Yoruba priesthood, Baba Lao, which means fathers of mystery. Uh, a Raba is the second highest ranking person. So I shared the vision of the just society with my priest, Ifayemi, and his comment was, yes, in the oral traditions of the Yoruba, they have teachings that say, in the beginning, this is after, um, you know, Africans have moved to the agricultural stage, and uh, these were not hunter-gatherers, these were agriculturalists. He said, in the beginning, males and females were equal, okay? <laughs> equal empowerment system. And then he said, at a certain point, males started getting more power than females and the females caused them trouble. They put magic on them, they did different things. So uh, when the sisters struck back with their magical and other approaches that sisters can use, you should know that uh, you know, there's a saying, uh, happy wife, 
is a happy life. Brothers are not smart enough to have a saying as wise as that. You should have a little poetic rhyme for yourself. But the sister knows that if you're really going to have some pleasure in a relationship, she needs to be happy. Now, she sold you on the idea that if she's happy, you're happy. That may only be partially true because happiness comes from within. But there's certainly half the truth because if she's miserable, that's going to definitely affect your happiness. You understand? So um, in, in this story, um, when men and women go to God, the men are plain, complaining because though they had disrupted balance in the beginning um, by, by taking more power. Uh, and, and then they had gone back to sharing power. And then they, you know, failed to do it again. Well, then they were in trouble, you know? And so um, for societies that are just, they require some balance between males and females. And in ethnically homogenous societies, it's a lot easier. If you're dealing with ethnically diverse societies, and that's a whole nother story. So that is uh, something that um, you have to work on. And I'll, I'll, I'll make some suggestions on that towards the end. But it is no accident that when white women were sometimes captured, when whites and Native Americans were engaged in warfare and lived among Native Americans, most of them never wanted to come back and live among their own people. Why? They experienced freedom. They experienced respect, you know, because that's what all human beings want. And that's basically what this just society principle is. And I, I might say this also. The Marxists are sincere in their effort to try and end capitalist oppression. And definitely capitalism is the source of uh, some of the worst oppression on the planet. If you want to talk about Aryanism is carried to the extreme under capitalism, and I'll come back in to that in a minute. So um, it's understandable that um, anyone that's talking about revolution in the age of um, industrial capitalism, for example, that Marx studied, uh, would see that as the source of oppression. And he's right, it was. But their vision for what the just society would be is incomplete because their, their idea was based on the distribution of goods and the fact that those who are oppressed who are the workers should be put in power. But they had no conception of a just society in which you're talking about a society that is just in, in its totality. And so one of the first things Marx should have questioned was the way in which males predominate in these Aryan societies. And so even in the case of revolution, he should have known that it would be a revolution executed by males, with males largely in power. And then what that could mean, especially if they're coming out of oppressive situations, as they all did, such as uh, Stalin and Lenin and Trotsky and people like that who come out of a czarist system where one dictator, the czar is dictating everything. So what's the likelihood that the people who come in power under what's supposed to be a revolutionary system are going to end up doing the same thing? You hear me? What's the likelihood of that? And then what happens when all power is concentrated in one person or a few people's hands, almost all of which are male? You know, so this is um, just a partial recipe, the, the Marxist formula for how you create just societies. It's more than just the distribution of wealth. It's got to do with power and it's on every level, but it's more than that. It's got to do with ethics. It's got to do with character. Nowhere in the Western Marxist model 
are there ideas for how to create the, the better human being? And especially at the level of leadership, which is where the worst inhumanity has been expressed, you know? So um, the first break then with the just society models occur in Africa, I could give other examples, but this imbalance, it doesn't mean that they descend into oppression. It just means that they're not gonna be as just. And it depends on how unbalanced the power distribution is between males and females, just how unjust that society can become. Uh, but generally, even though societies after the hunter-gatherer period will tilt more to the female or more to the male, um, there is, tends to be justness, especially in societies that are small where um, males and females have a direct say-so or at the village level, as I pointed out before, where males and females were making the decisions no matter how large the nation was, you know? And, and that's a, a hint at how you reconstruct these today. So uh, this is the first break. However, the greatest break comes with the emergence of the Aryan or Indo-Aryan culture and Aryan or Indo-Aryan cultural model. This um, Aryan cultural model was first of all based on an amoral system. Ethics didn't count in this system. And it was based on a warrior society in which males predominated. And it was based on a patriarchal society, again, in which males dominate at the family level and every other level. And most importantly, it was based on the dominance of the war leaders. Um, which uh, some historians like to call the nobility. There's nothing noble about them. They just happen to be maybe the physically strongest or the smartest or those that can manipulate themselves into the head of these warrior bands. And so, as I pointed out once or twice before, those who were in charge of the Aryan, A-R-Y-A-N, were called Arias. A-R-Y-A-S, meaning lords and masters. They were over the Aryans who were the foot soldiers and who did the bidding of their masters. This is a key thing. Now, this Aryan culture, therefore, is rooted in power. That is their ethos, that is their reason for being. And therefore, as I pointed out before, they give rise to a teleological culture, T-E-L-E-O-G-I-C-A-L, -E -E teleological. It means um, a culture based on utility. Everything is judged by whether it's useful or not. America is a pragmatic society based on the uh, philosophy of those who rule and run the country. And the thing that determines how things work here is what works, specifically what works for the powerful, because basically what works grows out of a culture of power where those who are in charge, who are the lords and masters, dictate to everyone else. And um, I, I pointed out this before that in the Indo-Aryan languages and all languages of Europe, when you get to the definition of good that precedes the era of Christianity in all languages, Greek, Roman, um, the Romance languages, I don't care what they are. Good has one meaning. 
strong. Bad has one meaning, weak. And so when blacks are talking about truth and justice and good and bad, they don't understand that their opponents are talking about something different. And don't forget that Christianity is not a um, Western-based religion, Semitic religion. The Hebrews were not Aryans. They had shared some things that were nomadic and whatnot, but they were not Aryans. And so with the coming of Christianity, they have a conflicting worldview that they got to deal with particularly New Testament, that the meek shall inherit the earth and all this stuff. This goes completely contrary to Arianism, where strong is good, weak is bad. So some in the West succumb to this, but most it's talk, it's not a walk. And for most, the Old Testament rules. And so when you see Constantine embracing Christianity, who uh, was the last of the uh, Roman emperors, it comes through a dream. He sees his soldiers at war and in the front is the cross. And so he sees the cross as the basis for him uh, acquiring victories. And so then Christianity becomes a handmaiden of the state. And so while there's contradictions in the doctrines of Christianity, the fact is, it's been used for the purpose of conquest and control. And while they'll talk the talk of love and brotherhood and everything else, and justice, as Rap Brown said, it means just iced. The powerful determine what the powerless get. And while we talk about the meek shall inherit the earth, yes, six feet of it. You hear me? And there's nothing wrong with humility as a spiritual practice. But in the engagement of war, be humble in appraising your enemy. But your goal is to defeat them. And you won't defeat them by being a doormat. Yeah. So this intrusion of the Indo-Aryan uh, from um, the areas of the Caucasus Mountains and uh, parts of Russia um, near the Black Sea. This intrusion begins around 4500 BC to 2500 BC. And it begins, it, its most important intrusion is, is into India and then later into Europe. And that's a whole nother thing. And so it is with this imposition that we have the disruption of the trilineal model. But not its destruction. Um, and so my topic for today is twinlinealism, the alternative to Arianism. So the Aryan model is a recent intrusion. The African model is much older. And while the Aryan model has ruled uh, for this period of their intrusion um, for Western Europe for a number of hundreds of years, where the British ruled the ways for 300 and the Romans had their period and the Greeks could never get their act together, um, the male-female empowerment model is the one that preceded their presence. And so in the Greek world, um, with the coming of the Aryan, you then find in their world after the coming of the Aryan, no word for right or ought in their language because now they have come up under um, the Aryan, Indo-Aryan cultural model. Uh, but prior to that, the Greek islands were occupied by a people called Pelagians. 
P-E-L-A-S-G-I-A-N-S. P-E-L-A-S-G-I-A-N-S. The Pelagians practiced the twin lineal culture. They, de they demonstrated great respect for females. They were also influenced at a certain point by ancient Kemet, but Kemet itself was influenced by this twin lineal model. Over a period of time, the Aryans who come into Greece don't come in the way they came in in a lot of other parts of Europe and just wage war. They come in slowly. And over time, they become the majority. There's no evidence of them um, wiping out the Greeks because we know they continue to exist or waging serious warfare. But over time, they overwhelmed the Greeks with numbers. And then they introduced um, this Indo-Aryan cultural model. Um, and so the Pelagians are subsumed underneath this. The Greek woman, who at one point had great power, and the Pelagians were probably Africans, um, now under Greek rule, under the Indo-Aryan rule, they're subordinated. And what happens as the Greeks take on the Indo-Aryan model, then while we're always focused on how the Greeks stole our philosophy and everything the Greeks had came from us, not true. Yes, they were influenced by us. Plato, Socrates, uh, Pythagoras especially, who spent over 20 years in the mystery systems, uh, was their best student and the one who was truest to uh, comedic philosophy. While it's true, there were these uh, intrusions and there was lessons learned by the Greeks uh, from the Chemites, it's true. But George James wasn't com completely right when he said that uh, Greek philosophy was stolen uh, Egyptian philosophy or African philosophy. The core of Greek philosophy was Indo-Aryan. And the proof of the pie is in the pudding and in the pudding, what did you see with the Greeks? Every city state was at war with the other. Why? Because it was a drive for power. And that has been true of Europe as well. When Europe comes into being, the same thing, the drive for power. And while the Romans were able to solidify a nation state that had some global uh, presence, uh, again, what motivated them? The drive for power. And who ran the show? The lords and masters. You hear me? The war leaders, very often. So the Greeks could never establish a national state because they couldn't get over the inner conflicts. Philip of Macedonia was able to impose some order on them and his son, Alexander the Great. They weren't Greeks, they were Macedonians. And then it was the Romans, but they were in their own drive for world power. Plato had this idea of the ideal state called the Republic. It didn't exist, but it was partially based on Sparta. And um, the key thing to understand is that while Plato had philosophers running his state, and some historians have said he was drawing from the Egyptian model, Pharaoh really wasn't a philosopher per se. The priests were but some, some pharaohs were. Asar definitely was the fount of wisdom for ancient Kemet. But while there was this influence of Kemet on Plato and his conception of the Republic, Plato's very idea of philosophy was foreign to the Kemites because it was a philosophy where reason ruled and feeling emotion and intu intuition was subordinate to reason. That's an idea foreign to African people. You hear me? But the key thing is, if you look at the Republic, the Republic was teleologically based. That is based on 
usefulness or utility or power. And so the key thing about the philosopher king is he ruled over everyone else. He ruled over them. And so everyone else um, performed their role in their appropriate slot. It was a unilineal, straight up and straight down system. Again, hierarchy, something that the African twin lineal spirit rejects. Hierarchy, uh-uh. <laughs> and we're right. Because when you got one person or a few people running everything, you know what I mean? You're going to have problems, even if they're well-intentioned. A Fidel Castro, a lot of people don't like hearing this. I like Fidel. I was in Cuba twice. I pointed out National Black United Front negotiated agreements with the Cuban government, you know, with Reverend Herbert Dowdry. I was vice chair. He was chair. And we got some concessions and stuff like that. And they had some good things. I enjoyed Cuba, you know, good educational system, you know, good athletic system a good health care system in spite of the embargo, but an economy that was a mess. And you could say the embargo caused it, but the embargo didn't stop him from having a top-rate educational system, didn't stop him from having a top-rate medical system, uh, and it didn't stop them from having a great spy system that kept Castro alive. 400 attempts on his life, able to overcome all of them. You understand? But the reason that they, this is my opinion, the reason that Castro couldn't really handle the food issue was he wasn't good on economics. Yeah, everybody ain't good at everything. You hear me? He had good character in the sense that he wasn't about accumulating wealth and stuff, but he sure was about accumulating power. And so the Cuban people, a majority of which are African, didn't have the leeway to improvise in the economy in ways in which. They could bring prosperity to this island in spite of the impression imposed by the blockade. Now, I know supporters of Cuba don't like hearing this, but the proof of the pie is in the pudding again, because Raul Castro, when he came into power after Fidel got ill, his brother, he began to in institute some policies that I said should have been done all along, African policies, where they're talking about cooperatives and stuff like that. But the government's still putting too much control over how that's exercised. And I understand Castro's concern. Castro did not want capitalism rearing its head and particularly um, multinational capitalism coming from the US and the Western world. So I understood that, I understood that. But the fact of the matter is the power is in the people and the people loved him, but they did not love the fact that the revolution was good at everything except breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's the heart of a revolution, eating. <laughs> You hear me? You may be hungry during the revolutionary period, but at some point, you're supposed to see some food on the table. And doctors are supposed to get remunerated as others are, not the way they are here, but, you know, to the point where, you know, they're at least making more than a cab driver, you know, and cab drivers should make money, so don't get me wrong. But I'm simply saying that a system that ends up resting on one person is in trouble, is in trouble. I don't care how good that person is. None of us are gods. Now let's get down to earth here because I'm going to be applying this to the United Snakes of America, or excuse me, the United States of America. <laughs> because uh, this is the, the situation some of us are in. Uh, people watch this show come from different places. So I'm not just... Uh, talking about the U.S., but in this case, I'm going to take the U.S. as an example of how this twin lineal model uh, can be used to take crookedness and make it straight, you know, and this applies to Africa as well. And by the way, in my book, Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality, I have a whole chapter uh, towards the end of the book looking at how you build continental uh, not only unity, but just societies, because we're talking about unifying Africa. But if, but if it's under the old nation states that are imitations of the European model, um, then, you know, there's no way it's going to be just. You'll have unity of dictators and unity of oppression. And that ain't going to happen anyway. A dictators ain't going to be able to pull that one off.
at least I hope that they don't. <laughs> so let's look at the U.S. And let's look at how this twin lineal model applies to this place. You've just had a bunch of Supreme Court decisions, you know, that affect just about every area of life, abortion, environmental protection, <clears throat> the rights of cities and states to enact any kind of legislation on gun carry, and a host of other things, the restrictions that have already happened to the voting rights uh, bill. You understand? The Supreme Court has played a role that was not defined for it in the Constitution, by the way, in the separation of powers. It's entered into realms it has no business in, like deciding on legislative decisions. They took that power and the Congress never challenged them. Just as uh, presidents have taken war, war making powers that's granted to the Congress, and the Congress had let presidents get away with it, you know? So if we're looking at Aryan power or the definition of power according to the Aryan worldview, I'll say straight up that the American so-called republic operates on the principle of arbitrary power where the good are the powerful and they can do what they want and the weak are put in the par powerless position and by the way in which the society views them are viewed and the same way that they're viewed in the Aryan system is no good for nothing, dirty people. And now since you have so many people reduced to homelessness, uh, homelessness itself is treated as a crime. People are thrown in jail for being homeless. You know what I mean? When in the richest country on the planet Earth, everyone should have a good roof over their head, you know? So, let's look at the Supreme Court and let's look at what's the basis for their decisions. Chief Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, who fought in the Civil War and um, came out opposed to um, this idea of um, having principles and things like this, because he saw abolitionism, the move to end slavery as the driving underlying cause of the Civil War, and he saw it as a problem. And so he is the author of Legal Pragmatism in the US, one of the authors, the biggest authors. And he comes up with the reasonable man standard, which lets corporations off. Because instead of judging a corporation that has done a harm or injury to somebody based on the particular act, he uses a general standard of what would a reasonable man do? That sounds okay. But what it means is that corporations end up getting off with, when they get verdicts against them, much lighter than they should have been. So that's a reasonable man standard. But it shows that Oliver Wendell Holmes was smart. Um, so he was asked, and I mentioned this once before in one of the previous shows, uh, he was asked, what's the basis for Supreme Court decisions? He made the mistake of telling the truth. And he said that uh, the Supreme Court inclined towards the most powerful forces in society, meaning the most powerful sources in society pretty well dictated um, where the Supreme Court would go in decisions. They would decide in favor of the rich and powerful who are virtually always white. Later, 
He said he was sorry he made this statement because it made him sound like Nietzsche. Nietzsche is, this is referring to a man called Frederick Nietzsche who formulated a philosophy which is Arianism, will to power. He said the drive of history, he's really referring to Arians, but he tries to treat it as universal law history, is the drive for the will to power. You know? And so he didn't want to be associated with that. What he really didn't want to do was reveal the basis for the Supreme Court. Remember when George Bush was put into office uh, by the Supreme Court, even though Gore was slightly ahead and all the votes had not been counted um, in Florida, where Bush's brother was governor. So they were stalling the vote count and everything else. So when the decision finally came out and um, Supreme Court is supposed to make decisions based on precedent, it's supposed to mean that you go back to previous cases like this and look at how they were decided and the, and the precedent determines the outcome. But as Oliver Wendell Holmes said, no, the outcome is determined by power. And so, um, when the decision was made, Alito said, there's no precedent for this. This is based on power. He said, we're the Supreme Court. He didn't say it's based on power. He said, we're the Supreme Court, meaning supreme as in power. He meant the same thing. You understand? And therefore, he plunged the country into two wars. Afghanistan and Iraq. And the um, Iraq war would have never occurred under Gore. Never. Because there was no rationale for it. But under Bush, with Cheney running the show, and now his daughter um, putting it to Trump, but don't forget where she comes from, but good, put it to him. But you don't get too many points from me given what you pulled. So the Supreme Court uh, operates based on um, their decisions reflecting the interests of the most powerful. And that is the heart of Arianism. And it has no consideration um, given to truth or justice. For 200 and over 40 years, the United States maintained the institution of slavery. And the Supreme Court never made the slightest attempt to overturn it. Because slavery was supported by the most powerful forces in this country. Not only the slave class, uh, slave owning class, but the manufacturing class that profited from slavery. And a whole lot of other powerful whites in this country that profited as well. Even old Abraham Lincoln didn't issue the Emancipation Proclamation to abolish slavery, which it didn't. It applied to the areas in which, uh, only to the areas in which Africans were enslaved. And of course, slave masters were not going to release their slaves based on a proclamation delivered by the Northern president who they were fighting against. And it didn't apply to the Midwest uh, where some states had supported the North, most of them had, uh, but on condition that they could maintain their slavery. So the Emancipation Proclamation, on the one hand, didn't end slavery, but it wasn't issued for moral reasons. And this is the key point. He issued it for teleological reasons, reasons of power, pure and simple because he was losing the war. Whites didn't have a reason to fight because they saw underneath this was the black issue, even though the war was being fought to maintain the union. Uh, so as I pointed out before, he failed to uh, issue the Emancipation Proclamation as long as the North was losing. It's only when they had a victory did he issue the Emancipation Proclamation. So as his advisors said, it would not appear that you were bending to Ethiopia, meaning the blacks, which he was. 
And so this act that's supposed to be an act of um, high moral conscience wasn't issued for moral reasons. It didn't have any application to, um, you know, who it should have. It, it didn't, it, it couldn't emancipate and didn't attempt to emancipate um, the enslaved Africans. And um, once it was issued, the North began to win. And quit saying Abraham Lincoln freed us. We know we're not free to this day, but that ain't the point. Uh, quit saying that he ended chattel slavery. We did out of the barrel of a gun. You hear me? We aimed it in the right direction. A good old master. You hear me? So our Black ancestors, our African ancestors fought for the truth. The system didn't care two cents about it. Now, the 14th Amendment to the Constitution was enacted to make Black citizens of the United States. But the Supreme Court bowed to the most powerful forces in the society and true Aryan political tradition, that is the corporate ruling class, and turned the 14th Amendment into a constitutional amendment that privileged corporations, turned them into individuals gave them citizenship rights when it profited them and then freed them from responsibility in just about every other way. Since when is a corporation a person? But that was a provision to guarantee your citizenship. And so what ends up happening? We end up going back through new slavery under Jim Crow, uh, under Southern style apartheid. The recent Supreme Court decision overturning the power of the Environmental uh, Protection Agency to control the emission of coal and other, envi uh, other environmental pollutants was done to bow to the power of the coal industry and other polluting industries. Now, this is the victory of another powerful force in this society, um, the libertarian conservatives. They have been seeking to remove um, government regulation of big business in all areas. And if you carry this to its logical conclusion, it means that you could have the dismantling of the government having any say so over uh, whether your water is clean. And we know that a lot of black communities have been drinking poisonous water to begin with, even with these protection agencies because we're black. And we know that environmental pollution infects and affects black communities more than anywhere else. And brown and red and yellow, especially red communities, especially uh, because these communities are located where the pollutants are the highest or they're put there where our communities are. And so um, again, this is Aryanism running this country and running it into the ground. And it's put the Supreme Court in a position where it's bankrupt as an institution. It, ha it, it enjoys hardly no support in this country. Among the masses of people, white, black, brown, red, and yellow, as do also the other institutions of government they have uh, very little respect among the American population. <clears throat> and we're not just talking about blacks, you know? Because the majority of people in this country are living in misery, the majority. So this is just the Aryan Lord and masterism in a new form, in the corporate form. It's displaced the nomadic form. In fact, it makes the nomads look um, not peaceful, but not half as threatening as this corporate order that through the issue of laws, through the IMF, International Monetary Fund, World Bank, a uh, host of other international institutions, through NATO, through all these different 
institutions, the will of the few, the so-called lords and masters, is imposed. And the rest of the planet is left to suffer. So the common view of the Constitution of the United States is that it's a marvelous document written in 1787 to establish democracy and equality. That's what they say. You know what I mean? First of all, this is not a democracy, it's a republic. Aristotle said his favorite form of government was aristocratic, but the best form to maintain slave uh, to us uh, uh, stability was the republic. Why? Because when you give people the right to vote, they get to choose between a couple of candidates, and they always end up choosing the same person. <laughs> That's what a republic is based on. And we'll see why. Because even though it's tweedly D and tweedly dumb, they are both up there to dumb you out, to make promises that will never happen, and to serve the powerful. There are few who don't. They are few and far between. So, the view of the Constitution as a people's document, the font of democracy, uh, was expressed by a white historian. It's been expressed by many, but I'm going to give one. George Bancroft, who described the Constitution this way, and I'm going to quote him. He says, uh, the Constitution knows no, quote, differences of dissent. Oh, really? <laughs> you mean an aster? Um, is no different from Smith, and we're just talking white people here, or Rockefeller is no distant, you know, difference from uh, Mr. Peabody, who uh, is a janitor, uh, no difference. So uh, the Constitution knows no difference of dissent or opinions. Oh, really, we all have equal say so here, really. Um, or of favored classes, or legalized religion, or the political power of property. What a piece of bull. You know what I mean? What a piece of bull. In other words, um, everybody's say so is equal here, huh? Really? Really? Um, we all have the same megaphone. When, when we speak, everybody hears us. Really? Um, and. Uh, there is no particular power of property. We know who ends up being able to play a role in government, property owners, and big property owners in this country. So he goes on to do this flowery statement, which I'm sure he got a good uh, fee for writing this piece of propaganda called the book. The institutions and laws of the country rise out of the masses of individual thought, which like the waters of the ocean are rolling evermore. Oh, individual, he's here talking about white people, individual white people all had an equal say so in this republic. Of course, it would keep us out, Native Americans, Asians, uh, Latinos, uh, and by the way, their own women. <laughs> but it's supposed to roll like the mighty waters. Everybody's views are considered. My, my. If so, then I wonder why there's so much misery today. But there's another historian, and there are other historians of this view. I'm quoting one. His name's Charles Beard. He had another view of the purpose of the Constitution. In his words, you can quote him. Inasmuch as the primary object of government beyond the mere repression of physical violence is the making of the rules which determine the property relationships of members of society. He's saying the main role of government is to protect private property. And guess whose? <laughs> sure ain't yours. They will run a, a redevelopment agent or run a freeway through your community and your neighborhood and your house in a minute if they choose to. Huh. 
or gentrify or just completely wipe your community out. But um, so it's not our property that's being protected. Be clear about that. But he said, so one of the roles of government is one, repression of physical violence, preventing people from killing each other, other people invading your country. That's the best view of the use of violence for the government. And um, determine the property relations of members of society. And then he goes on, the dominant classes whose rights are thus to be determined must perforce obtain from the government such rules that are consistent with the larger interests necessary to the continuous of the economic processes. And um, they must control the organs of government. In other words, what he's saying is that the richest, most powerful forces in society must either control the government directly or control it through the laws, and I would say, or both. <laughs> and in most cases, it's or both. Because the way this country works is, and Western Republican government is, that um, the people who, for example, work for regulatory agencies, they usually, in the federal government, they come from the corporations that are being regulated. And then they go back to those corporations. Some of them worked in the regulatory agencies, and because they've been so kind to the corporations, they go and get rewarded with big salaries when they retire. You know, and that's true across the board. You don't get elected to Congress unless enough big money goes behind you. And that is generally the corporate elite. A few are able to uh, buck that trend. A Ron Dellums could buck that trend. An Adam Clayton Powell could because he came from a, a black district and was the best congressman Congress has ever had in acting legislation for the poor. A whole lot of it. People could talk all day about his uh, playing around and stuff like that. Yeah, he was no saint, you know, but he delivered for the people. Yeah, he had an ego. He, he felt threatened by King rising as a leader and all this kind of stuff. But his heart was in the right place. He did a whole lot of good stuff for not only blacks, but poor people in general. So... Beard is basically saying that the richest, most powerful forces in society have to control the government directly or indirectly, but they have to control, and I'm saying both. Now, Beard did a study, and other historians have as well, of the economic background of the political uh, leaders who wrote the Constitution. There were 55 of them, all white men who met in Philadelphia in 1787. You hear me? Now, um, what was their background? He studied all of them. Um, most of them following the position of lords and masters, those who rule an Aryan society, though they weren't necessarily warriors. In fact, very few were. They'll pay the warriors. They ain't about to put their necks on the line for anything. So he found that a majority of them, all of whom were white men, were men of wealth. They were lawyers by profession, most of them. Most of them were men of wealth. They owned land. They owned slaves. They were manufacturers. They owned shipping. Um, they lent or they loaned money out at a high interest rate. And 40 of the 55 held government bonds. They're invested in the government. They would put their money into the government. So they get a high return that would be paid for by poor whites. And of course, the labor of enslaved Africans. Uh, so... These were the people that were supposed to be uh, the voice of the people, rolling like the mighty seas, <laughs> rolling over you. Ain't no water in it unless it's a drowning ocean. It's going to drown you right out. So then let's see what the interests of these powerful people 
um, who formed the federal government, what it was in shaping a constitution, okay? The manufacturers wanted and saw that planted in the constitution were provisions protecting them um, and providing tariffs against goods that would be coming from other countries and putting taxes on those goods so that that's a tariff. So that that was one interest that they had, not hardly the interest of the common everyday person. The money lenders didn't want the people to have paper money. By the way, when people cashiered out at the end of the War of Independence, they were given promissory notes. They weren't given money. And you'll see what problems that caused. That happened in World War I. At the end of World War I, soldiers were given promissory notes. And that's why they had a bonus march on Washington, where they were suppressed by General Douglas MacArthur. Uh, same thing. Put your neck on the line. The officer class was well paid, well fed, well uniformed, while those who were fighting didn't have shoes, barely had clothes, were lucky to get any food. So um, the money lenders did not want paper money to be issued because then the people who got it could pay their debts. You'll see in a minute, this is behind why the Constitutional Convention was held in the first place. The poor being put in a certain position where they couldn't pay their debts and were being indebted when they shouldn't have been. So then you had others who were the so-called founding daddies and um, they were speculators on land. George Washington was. Speculators on land were people who were stealing Native American land. And um, they wanted the government to be able to protect them in their actions, be able to uh, enforce their land seizures with the military. They could kill Indians, you know, or Native Americans, so that they could secure their land holdings. This is, by the way, affirmative action at the point of a gun. You got blacks running around talking about they don't want no affirmative action. This whole country is based on affirmative action, except it's just based on the powerful affirmative, affirmatively taking whatever they want. You know, um, slaveholders, what did they want? They wanted the armed might of the federal government behind them to protect them against slave revolts and fugitive slaves. And you had the fugitive slave law. Um, implemented in the uh, 1850s, where slaves could be grabbed, uh, former enslaved Africans could be grabbed off the streets and returned to slavery, whether they had papers or not. You know, that's what they wanted. And of course, they wanted the Second Amendment, which would arm whites against blacks. Note the Supreme Court decision on the New York gun carry laws, you know, um, where the Supreme Court is, is making it difficult for cities or states to enact legislation restricting the use of guns. Now, on the positive side, you need restrictions because you uh, are facing all this mass gun violence. But on the other side, the black hand side, Blacks need to be armed to protect us against those who have unrestricted use of arms. And when we're armed, the government treats you in a different way because the Second Amendment uh, was not written to empower Blacks to carry arms. It was written to empower whites to carry arms to um, control Blacks. And then, of course, the bondholders, they wanted the federal government to tax the poor, the workers, the middle class, uh, to pay off the bonds they held. <laughs> you see, this is your great government that represents your free expression. And of course, we were no part of the picture being considered uh, three-fifths 
of a person, not even a human being. So who wasn't a part of the Constitutional Convention? Enslaved Africans, so-called free men and women of color, Native Americans who really didn't want to be a part of it. They were fighting to maintain their independence in this country. Um, indentured servants, they weren't there. A lot of these were whites. And women, here we're talking about white women, you know? And a majority of white men, they were excluded as well. See, this goes back to the Lord and Master definition where the Lord and Master is good. The masses are the no good for nothing dirty scum. And this is the way the masses of people have been treated in Europe, the way in which Indo-Aryans or Indo-Europeans treat the masses of their people as dirty scum to this day. And right now, the rich in this country are doing everything to grab the few things that are left. And the one thing on their agenda right now is social security, grab it. Because that's a multi-trillion dollar trust fund. And they'll use every excuse and the, the media is supporting them by calling it an entitlement. As though it's something the government's giving you. No, uh-uh. You paid into that, that's yours. But if the Republicans get both houses of Congress and the presidency, Social Security is gone. And George Bush was going to do it except for the war in Afghanistan and Iraq in his second term. He got diverted, actually started aging, had realized that he had really fouled up with Cheney in charge. But he didn't really figure it out until after he faced his losses on the battlefield. That's the only thing that saved you from losing Social Security. And the reason Trump didn't knock it out is because he had promised uh, his based through fake populism that he wouldn't touch their social security, but he made it clear that if he was elected to a second term, he would. Because Trump cares only about Trump. So why was the Constitutional Convention called in the first place? This has to do with trilinealism, believe it or not. It was called because there was a popular uprising occurring across the country. If you know your history, you know what that uh, uprising was. This was an uprising of ex-War uh, of Independence veterans who, when their service ended, as I just pointed out, they didn't get money. They got promissory notes that they would be paid later. And some veterans not getting paid during the course of the world war actually deserted or left the army, you know, because uh, they weren't being paid. And so what happened when they returned to their farms, those that had farms, they found that they were being foreclosed on because they hadn't paid their taxes. Why hadn't they paid their taxes? They were fighting in the War of Independence. And they weren't, they weren't paid, so they wouldn't have any money to pay their taxes. Had they stayed on their farms, you know, whatever their crop was would have at least represented some money. Was any consideration done for this? No. In the Aryan view, the no good for nothing dirty scum, we have the chance to grab their property. Um, so you had rebellions in some of the major cities, particularly in the East Coast. And Daniel Shea in Western Massachusetts, um, who was a person who had fought in the War of Independence, he fought at Lexington and Bunker Hill and Saratoga and was wounded in battle. Um, so he leaves the military because he wasn't being paid. When he comes home, he finds that uh, he is being called to court because he hasn't paid his debt, which he couldn't pay for the reasons I've just given. Um, and so he, along with others, organized a movement that proved to be very threatening to George Washington and company. And he, he was particularly motivated in his action also by other things. And, and this is one example. I mean, this, this shows, but this is common. And again, the Aryan philosophy. Uh, 
he saw a sick white woman, you know, who couldn't pay her debt being relieved of her bed and being left on the floor so they could grab her debt, uh, grab her, her bed as partial payment for her debt. Now, this is how bad it was, you know what I mean? So all these indignities and others led Daniel Shea to lead a rebellion of 700 armed farmers, most of whom were War of Independence veterans. Um, and he faces down an army of 900, 200 more soldiers and probably better armed than everything else. And he asks the general in charge, because this general is there to protect the court when they seize property. You understand? Note the definition that the historian gave that one of the reasons for government is, you know, controlling the violence. Well, in this particular case, it's controlling violence that's being expressed in the interest of the people. It's not somebody out here going to commit a crime. They're stopping a crime from happening, a crime of the state, foreclosing on property when it shouldn't have happened. And so Shea asked the general in charge of the 900 soldiers, could he allow his soldiers, his armed you know, militia, to march? And they beat their drums. <laughs> general should have never said yes. And so more and more of the soldiers who are protecting the court joined Shea. So pretty soon, uh, the army sent to protect the court is outnumbered. And so the hearing is called off. But eventually, Shea's rebellion fails. It's suppressed by bigger forces sent out by the so-called founding fathers. Um, so the Constitutional Convention, which was not popular at that time, was held to prevent any future Shea's rebellions because what the wealthy, who had shaped this constitution based on the control of the society by the powerful and the rich. They didn't want their power and their wealth overturned. And so that was the main reason for the Constitutional Convention. There were others. They said that the uh, Federation of States led to a weak central government, but the Confederation of States was based on the Iroquois Confederacy, and it was based on larger and smaller states having an equal say-so. Uh, but with the federal government, there would be a federal government that would have overall control and say-so, and would be able to protect the privileged against the underprivileged. Uh, so what's the point of this discussion what does it have to do with twin linealism, the alternative to Arianism? What's the point of taking uh, the twin lineal male female model of empowerment and even injecting it into this context and uh, using it as an alternative to Arianism? The twin lineal just society model that was embraced by the planet's people for most of human history brought happiness and prosperity for people of the planet starting in Africa. That model needs to be updated to today's reality as a model for creating just societies. It's only part, but it is the key part. We're living in a time of power shifts, global power shifts, where power is shifting from the West to the East and will shift eventually to Africa. We're living in the era of power shift where power is shifting from whites to blacks. And a lot of these extreme decisions that are coming, including boat rigging that is now being justified by many states, this is designed to hold off the high water that is coming through the torrent coming from 
black, brown, red, and yellow people becoming the dominant numbers in this country. And you will always dismiss this because not all of you, but some of you, because you don't, you don't engage in battle. Those of you that haven't, the first rule in battle is some numbers. You hear me? And the reason why Native Americans could be overwhelmed is they were overwhelmed numerically and then with technology, gatling guns and stuff like that, and disease and other kinds of genocidal war. But the key thing was numbers. And with this constitution, it was shaped not only by the rich, but it was shaped by the rich who were following a paradigm. Good for a few, not for the many. And so with the shift in numbers, there will inevitably come the clash of paradigms. And you, whether you're African or Native American or Asian, Latino, or a sensible white person, <laughs> you, in your heart, you know that there's something better. And there's something better than uh, living from day to day working your behind off and having nothing, um, living in misery rather than living in joy. So we're living in this time of power shift and as power shifts, it's this model that provides an alternative to this Aryan arbitrary power model and racist model because the Aryans brought in the first system of racism in the world in India through their caste system. And then later, other parts of the world begin to adopt it of the Aryan world. And so when you combine then racism with this arbitrary powerism, that, that's a recipe for genocide. And by the way, that's a recipe you better be aware could happen here. And you'd better prepare yourself for that to see that it doesn't happen. This is not a society based on kindness or care for those who have the least. So the twin lineal model of the just society provides the model that King and Malcolm were looking for and that a lot of movement activists have been looking for, both black, brown, red, yellow, some who are white. King noted, that by 1965, when we covered the revolutionary Martin Luther King with the brilliant Menu Ampin, um, by 65, King concluded the movement had moved from civil rights to human rights. Malcolm had reached a similar conclusion, but for international reasons, international reasons, uh, because he was looking at internationalizing the black freedom movement and taking the US before international bodies, which he knew the US had created, but to um, charge them with human rights violations. That was a strategy on his part. King was more practical in that and more realistic in that he realized that the struggle had moved beyond uh, rights to a struggle for power. And in this particular case, he said that it had been cheap to get the right to vote, to end segregation. The government didn't have to pay for that. It also made the government look better internationally in the world, uh, but that the struggle for human rights would be costly. Why? Because then you would have to deal with issues of empowerment. So the twin lineal just society model is an empowerment model. It's a best expression of human rights because it centers power in the hands of human beings, specifically males and females. Now I wanna say this, obviously in a society in which males and females come of different colors and different cultures, when you have a society of uh, a dominance that is the majority of white males and females, then you're going to have a problem because even if this society adopted a just society model that is a model where all the males and females are equally empowered to govern every phase of society, <coughs> if whites are the majority, 
chances are it's not going to be just. There might be a minority of whites that will depart from that. That's the way their history works. But you're going to have to have the most powerful coalitions possible to make that model work in a society that's not homogenous. And this society never will be. So the point is with power shifts, in this case, the shift of numbers, numbers bring along culture. And as someone who's organized Latinos, Asians, and has worked with Native Americans, and it was very revealing in the interview and in the discussion with uh, the Minister of Culture, Emory Douglas, Black Panther Party, he made the point that the American Indian movement aim was inspired by the Black Panther Party. That's a very important point, because if there's a group in this country that would have the least reason to move inspirationally behind us, it would be Native Americans. Why? Because they have been the ones who have uh, been the uh, dominant group in this country prior to the coming of the Europeans. They have waged fierce wars of resistance. They face genocide, but they're coming back in numbers. Though small, they're growing. And, and they have a tradition of resistance. So the fact that they could in, be inspired by us is telling you something about the central role of African-American culture, which applies to all areas, political, social, economic, family, the arts, and everything else, the role of African-American culture in affecting all other cultures and yours is the leading group in this country. Because it's a culture grounded in freedom. And it inspires other people to stand up, not just here, but around the world. It's a culture that creates chain reactions. When we go into motion, other people go into motion. The Black Panther Party inspired the Brown Berets, uh, inspired the uh, Puerto Rican uh, movement in this country, um, as other movements for liberation among our people have. So. When we're talking about the twinlineal family and just society paradigm, it is one that is designed to create real human rights. When the Constitution was formulated as an afterthought, um, they included a Bill of Rights. But there was no Bill of Powers, except that built into the Constitution was the enhancement of the power of those who were already in control. When the president of the Constitutional Convention was asked who should rule America, he said those that own it should rule it. Uh, and that should give you another clue. If you're gonna have a just society model, you can't have a society in which the elements of life can be privately owned, water, air, and land. It should be collectively accessible for the fair use of anyone that will use it for their own survival and prosperity, as it prevailed in Africa among Native Americans and most of the ancient societies of the world, where there was no concept of land, air, and water being owned. You know what I mean? That's a whole nother thing. That comes under your communal tradition. Um, so why this twin lineal model? See, Madison was one of the authors of what was called the Federalist Papers. And the Federalist Papers were papers written by those who were part of the Constitutional Convention to defend it. And this is where he states the true role of the federal government. And this is consistent again with the Aryan philosophy of control and domination. He said this, the role of the federal government is to control the people. And then he threw in this contradictory principle that was designed to make it sound good, sound righteous. Not only is the role of federal government to control the people, but then he said it is to control itself as though people with unlimited power are going to put any check on power. Huh. That's like taking a serial killer and putting them in charge of protecting human life. That's like putting Jesse James in charge of the banks. And by the way, 
I understood what Jesse James was doing. He was poor. He was robbing the rich. Unfortunately, then they didn't have federal deposit insurance, I don't think, at that time. And so poor people could lose, you know, when they lost their savings. But the fact is he was going after the rich, you know, at least I could say that much. So the role of federal government wasn't to express the will of the people. It was to control the people. Now, the real question is why? Well, it's obvious so that they could um, exercise their power and protect it. That's obvious. We just gave the analysis on that. You use common sense, you could figure it out. But guess what? The real reason was that the masses of whites, as racist as they were, were being oppressed by this system and they had within them elements of the twin lineal view. It didn't, they didn't have all of it, but they had the essence of it. And so when Madison discussed why government had to be created to control the people, he said it was so that the people, he's talking about the masses of white people, mainly white males. So a government to control the people was necessary to prevent the people, white people, from equitably distributing the wealth. You hear that? That was a demand they had. It's called leveling. Anyone with any sense would see somebody walking around decked in jewels, uh, living in palaces, where they get lost, going from room to room. You understand? While they're living uh, on the on the ground, you know, you know, they're living in alleys. Their children are doing slave labor under the industrial system. Um, of course, they would want the wealth equitably distributed. That's common sense. This society calls that socialism. Well, yeah, actually, uh, that's how the West defines it, you know. But there is socialism for the rich. They get everything. In fact, it's unbalanced socialism. The government is there for them to dip into anything. They can go out and rob you right and left. And then when the economy collapses, they go and save them and let your houses go into foreclosure, even under a black president. And some of you so happy to see some black in a black face in a higher space that you don't even want to say anything. You hear me? They tell you to shut up. He couldn't do it. White people had his hands tied, had his hands tied, nothing. He was in a historical circumstance where great history is made in crisis. He had a great crisis, but they didn't train him for this at Harvard. They trained him for neoliberalism to see that the goodies went to the rich. And he's smart enough. He said he got 140 IQ. I don't know what that means. Smart enough to realize he'll get some of the goodies when he gets out. And he's getting them. You hear me? I know some of you still don't like hearing this, but some of you do. So the point is, while the white masses who wanted to equitably distribute the wealth didn't have the vision for equal empowerment of males and females, not even with their own females, let alone equal empowerment of males and females, black, brown, red, and yellow. That was out of their mind. But they had the idea that a few shouldn't have everything and the masses should have next to nothing. They had that idea. And in a new society where the demographics have shifted and where some heads need to get wrapped on right, guess what? You're going to find a whole lot more embracing that. Tell me who's going to turn down a good house. In Europe, they provide some of these things. Some of this isn't even revolutionary. This is New Deal stuff applied by the Europeans. You know what I mean? So you get some good housing and stuff. Get out of jail. You got a place to go. And you've been trained for a job. You know what I mean? Huh? And education is, in, in many cases, free. 
as it was when I went to school. But was it a hundred dollars a year under Brown's uh, Pat Brown's uh, legislation? You know, for higher education, New York, same thing at that time. So I started this show off when I first started a couple of years ago. I said I'm not an OG. I'm not. An original gangster. Their brothers on the street will say, hey, OG, I say, thank you, brother. I know you mean that as a compliment. I ain't no OG. Ain't nothing original about gangsterism. You know what I mean? I'm an OR. I'm an original revolutionary. And the twin lineal model is the best piece in my arsenal. I've got all, I've innovated in six areas, and these six areas are all good for shifting societies from unjust to just, starting with the person. And, and the key point I want to make about these models is they're not just for 200 years or 100 years or 50 years or whenever this thing crumbles. They're for now. The twin lineal model is something that you can apply and should be applying to today. And if you've got a good family relationship, you are. You just may not call it that because there's a balance going on in your relationship. There's a respect for the other. If you're a sister, for the brother. If you're a brother, for the sister. If you're a male, for the female. Whatever your ethnicity is. If you know you got that going, then you've got the foundation of what twin lineal-ism is based on. And then if you've got with the male something sensitive going on, where they're trying to be kind and nice, and a lot of brothers are, contrary to popular opinion. They ain't all out here dogging people, you know? If you've got that, then that's really the basis for justice, you know? And I, you know, I surround myself with brothers like this who, whose mantra is to keep their wives happy. That's their thing, you know what I mean? That's their thing. They go to great pains to do that, as well as their daughters or sons and daughters, you hear me? As well as grandparents. They're doing the twa thing. They may not know who the twa is, but it's a part of their DNA. It's a part of what it is to be human. Um, so this twin lineal model um, starts with you in your own life. In your conception of a just society, um, any society that's going to be based on a constitution needs to have not just a bill of rights, but a bill of powers. And the bill of powers needs to guarantee your right to freedom from racism in a real sense. You're going to have to have the power to enforce that. The right to your freedom to have a roof over your head and a good roof over your head, a right to good health care, a right, check this one out to the equitable distribution of the wealth. <laughs> huh? <laughs> a right to freedom from imprisonment, meaning a society without prisons. That's what we operated for over 130, 140, 150,000 years. Native Americans didn't have no prison. You know what I mean? Most people on this planet didn't. You know? What's that about? So, in a society where the human being is respected, human life is respected, and a society in which we live in harmony with Mother Nature, with the cosmos, which we did for most of our existence. And I would say in this society, Native Americans uphold the deepest knowledge on this. They have the, the, the deepest understanding of what it means to be a, a custodian of nature, of Mother Nature. But that's built in to our culture, too. And it's something that we have to draw on in creating uh, just societies. And so we've got to work on this internal synthesis of the masculine within the feminine. Um, that if you're a male, work on the feminine side, the sensitive, the kind, the nurturing side. If you're a female, work on that strong side, which sisters don't have to work on too much. If you recall the thing I did on the divine feminine, uh, it starts off with, um, you know, the essence of being uh, a black or African female 
in this society, but in the world, is being super strong. At the same time, being a lady. You hear me? Don't take no mess, but at the same time, can rock your world. You know what I'm talking about? Huh? <laughs> yeah. And uh, the brother, the same thing. You know what I mean? To express your masculinity in a society which is stacked against it is to embody bravery and courage and creativity, but in a kind way, in a nice way. The way my father did. When a guy's getting ready to go off and abuse a woman, tap him on the shoulder, say, don't do it again, buddy. <laughs> and when he did, he'd knock him out and then stand over him and said, I told you. He had a warrior's code. Give you a chance. I do that too. Sometimes that ain't smart. Sometimes you don't give your enemy any warning. You just take him out. I don't mean kill him, but I mean, you know, do whatever you have to do to neutralize him. To see that Life is protected. So twin lineal-ism is taking what is old and working it in to what is new. And what is really old about freedom? Freedom is an urge inside of every human being, no matter what time or place um, they live. And so this twin lineal view of the just society, which the book Return to the African Mother Principle and Male and Female Equality is based on. And I just hit the top. There's a whole lot to this baby, you hear me, um, is the key to unlocking the door to just societies, just humanities, just males and females. So I hope you got something out of this. This is real revolution, by the way. And if you haven't subscribed, subscribe. Hit the subscriber button and encourage other people to subscribe. And if you can, make a donation to the show. I put over 25000 into this show out of my pocket. A few people have made donations here, and I appreciate it. And, you know, we've, we've hired somebody who is recruiting uh, – laying out programs and they started in recruiting more subscribers. So uh, that costs money. So I'm, I'm not in this for profit. You don't see any corporations uh, doing ads on this show. you got a, enough of a loyal listenership right now that I could get some. I, I don't plan to, you know what I mean? If the corporations are the embodiment of an Arianism, what am I doing promoting them, you know what I mean? And branding and all this stuff that people do, get rich, they get to be branded. Well, I get it, but <laughs> remember where that came from. So this show is about offering some visions of just societies, of just human beings, of strategies and ways for us to improve our lives, to promote self-knowledge, self-respect, self-love, self-devotion, and self-discipline. It all starts with the self. You don't love yourself. You can't do anything for anybody else. So that's it. Um, what I like to see is if you got any questions. And I see Norman, the brother who woke me up. <laughs> it, it's amazing that the brother, see his picture up there. That's the brother who woke me up right there. My buddy. Uh, now, if you wake somebody up and then you go listen to what they have to say, that's nice. Norman's older than me, a couple of years older. So thanks, Norman. Um, so any questions, cause I saw most of these comments up here, but I didn't see, uh, any questions or comments because I I'm giving you a key. I spent a lifetime working on this. God was kind enough to give me an answer. I spent five years writing that mother principles, 15 disciplines to write it. Hardest thing I ever did. So uh, I see here, brother, uh, Kamari, Baba Tashaka, any reading recommendations on origins, Ray Arianism? Yeah, you'd be interested in that. <laughs> I'd say read uh, Nietzsche's works 
um, who is uh, an articulator of the Aryan worldview in the modern uh, setting. So one is a book called The Genealogy of Morals. Uh, what he's doing is he's honestly telling you what the white world is uh, based on, you know, modern white world. And uh, this is another one here, Beyond Good and Evil. Now, he, 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 he'd make jokes of this, but he was really serious, you know, that uh, the drive for power uh, in the Western world um, it's got nothing to do with morals. And while he's been treated as a, a racist, a Nazi, uh, probably as if you say most Europeans are racist, maybe in that sense, but he wasn't um, advocating doctrines of Nazism, but he was an influence on Hitler in that this arbitrary powerism. But that's ingrained in the Indo-Aryan culture. You know, so those are two, and there are others that you could uh, read. Got any other? Um, and you know, I, I think Marimbani's book Urugu is okay. Um, it's dealing with. Uh, it, it's interesting. Her book is based on uh, looking at um, the unjust society, and she used Urugu is the term for the pale fox in Dogon philosophy, which is symbolic of the masculine minus the feminine principle. And so that's a symbol for disorder. And so she's used it to look at the uh, European worldview, heavily focusing on the Greeks. So that's a good book. Mine and hers are two books complement each other. She comes out of SNCC, I come out of CORE. I pointed out before we both presented our present, our books at ASCAD Association of the Study of Classical African Civilization in uh, 1995, when both books came out. And um, we presented before a thousand people. And John Henry Clark was there, Asa Hilliard was there, Theofello Bingo, Wade Nobles, Leonard and Rosalind Jeffries, um, and a host of others. And so she presented first at her request and then I presented. Uh, so, you know, my book's on the just society, hers on the unjust society. So that's something uh, worth reading. And when my book is finished on Seba, I'll be doing a critique of the Aryan worldview. We don't know the Aryan worldview. We know racism. We don't know the Aryan worldview. Now, most Aryans do, but they see it from their own standpoint. So, again, they're seeing it through white eyes, or Aryan eyes. And so you're not going to get the uh, whole truth there. Any other questions or comments? Because that's a point of doing this live. Thanks, Norman, for your comment. Hi, Aheka, Hotep, able to have a brief presence here on the live, on the live, have to run the complete replay later. Okay, I get you. Um, um, Brother Ugawa, didn't Charles Beard write the book, An Economic Interpretation of the Constitution of the United States? I think so. Um, yes, Brother Oba said, the communal democratic way is still alive in the continent. Yeah, everything is decided in this way in each commune level, but the European model is still in the way. Yeah, true. At the village level, uh, the communal thing still is in operation. It's in some cases been compromised. For example, um, in Tanzania, if you bought land, then they would put a limit on it. 99 years. That's a compromise between the communal tradition where land wasn't sold and the private property tradition where whoever gets the land, who purchases it, 
it's theirs as long as they don't lose it. Um, so yes, those two models are competing, but at the village level, it's what it's what is enabling Africa to survive, and especially the uh, continuation of the um, division of labor, where women are primarily agriculturalists and men do other work, including hunting, but other work. But under colonialism, too much work has been put on the backs of women. Um, so another comment here, Alicia, the object is everything for Europeans. You have to read and listen to Dr. Edwards Nichols who have uh, wrote about this. Okay, I might check that out myself. Um, and there's a comment here by Alicia. Utility reminds me of how they objectify everything. Yeah, that's true. That's a part of it. They separate themselves from whatever they're about to control. LaShonda Henderson, I like that distinction. I heard you express they learn towards, they lean towards the clan mothers, but they were not matriarchal. Yes. And that's usually what's happening with anthropologists is they're trying to explain a culture of balance and they have no terminology for it. And it's one that uh, gives some favor to women, uh, but not at the expense of men. And it is not one where women are ruling exclusively. So they use the term matriarchal, sometimes matrilineal. Neither of these terms are accurate. Twinlineal is the appropriate term. Jeez, I lost some questions here. <clears throat> see if it'll come back up. Yeah, I got it back. Okay. Let's see if there's anything else here. Okay, let me go down, see if there's, it says there's some new questions here. Let's see if there are. If so, what is it? Brother Ugawa, this generation seems to understand this paradigm needs to come to an end, but most seem unwilling to abandon some aspects of the system. How should this be reconciled when organizing. Well, yeah. Um, one thing is, if you're involved in a movement greater than yourself, then that is the uh, classroom for change and transformation because it's bigger than you. And so you're going to have to then come to grips with what are obstacles in your way of uh, improving the conditions of life for our people and for humanity? And you're also going to uh, have to deal with your own internal contradictions, which we all have. And you're going to have to work on them. Uh, and I think one of the biggest things that uh, particularly the younger generation, but people in this society generally uh, have trouble abandoning is this um, value for materialism. Now, I think the, the older generation clearly believes people before money. The break that's occurred in the choice between two cultures with these forces that have hit our community since 68, um, where greater impoverishment has been imposed on our community, greater breakdowns have occurred in families and communities. There is still... Um, when there's a clash between materialism and peopleism, materialism too often is valued in a higher place. And that is going 
<clears throat> against the core essence of African and African American culture. People before money and things. And if you're engaged in struggle for justice, whatever kind of struggle it is, that can serve as a transformative um, classroom because what you're doing is sticking your neck out for other people. And very often people you don't even know. And what you're discovering is that's the purpose of being human is to serve something higher than yourself. That's the purpose of being human. There's no real satisfaction in life in um, just you know being consumed in yourself. And material things won't provide love. And I'm not saying people shouldn't have anything. I'm not saying that. I'm simply saying people before those things, they come first. So I think that, um, there's a lot of work we have to do. Part of it is also respecting what our elders have left us because our elders have often lived according to this truth, not all of them, but many, and have placed their people first. And that's why we're in the position we're in. We have something. It came from our elders, you know, and they're the transmitters of culture. So, you know, I think there's a lot. And people have to do their homework. There's a lot of stuff that people have to do. But mainly, make the right cultural choices. Um, my book, um, the one that I use for this show, is Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality. And uh, the other book is The Integration Trap, Generation Gap, caused by a choice between two cultures. And uh, when you press into this uh, show here on the screen, you'll see an ad for um, book sales. And you click in, and you can purchase them directly uh, through this site. So this book here. Return to the African Mother Principle of Male and Female Equality. Um, it sells for $24.95, and we'll ship it to you. Uh, you gum, go through Gumroad, you can get the book. And um, this book, The Integration Trap, Generation Gap, caused by a choice between two cultures. It's a follow-up on um, the first book, and it addresses some generational issues that affect um, Black people in this country and African people around the world. And then there's a book called The Art of Leadership, Volume 1, Volume 2 is out of print. <clears throat> Check those out. So I see that's it. So I hope you got something out of this. You know, from your OR, your original revolutionary. I hope you got something original today. Hotep.